Jonathan, so oh. thank you. Thank you very much, Jacob. I know you may not recognize me. I did get a haircut. <laughs> My wife is here tonight, so I wanted to look good. So if you see her later, just tell her what I told you last time. He does a good job. Uh, so let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 11. 1 Samuel chapter 11. 1 Samuel chapter 11. It's right after 1 Samuel chapter 10, right before 1 Samuel chapter 12 on page 368. And Jose is not here to contradict me tonight, so we're good. 1 Samuel chapter 11. If you are having problems finding 1 Samuel, just start flipping through your Bibles. You'll see Samuel, Kings, Chronicles. Of course, 1 Samuel is at the beginning of those books, about a quarter of the way through. It'll be good. So let's review last time on 1 Samuel. Um, they wanted a king. They went into battle. They lost the battle because they thought that if they just brought God's box, that they would win. But it's not his box that they needed. It was his presence. It was a relationship with him, and they didn't have that. So they lost the battle. The box of God, the Ark of the Tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, it got stolen by the Philistines. I don't know if stolen is the right word. It was won in battle by the Philistines, and they stuck it in their God's temple, the God of Dagon. And when they woke up in the morning, the, the God of Dagon was on his face uh, in front of the holy box. Now, of course, Dagon's not a real God. It was just a statue. So they picked their, their statue up. They picked up their God, put him back in this place, thought that was weird. And the next morning they woke up, and Dagon was once again on his face, but his head and his arms had broken off on the threshold to that temple before the Ark of the Lord. Then the Ark, of, or sorry, then the Lord sent plagues among them, which we seem to think it's hemorrhoids and rats. And they started going, man, this is not a good idea. Let's get this Ark out of here. And they sent it to the next Philistine city. And guess what happened there? They got the plagues, and they sent it to the next Philistine city. And you got to be thinking, these Philistines are thinking, I don't want this thing anymore. Don't send it to me. Let's send it back to where it came from. But then they're all, they're all thinking, like, what if it was a joke? What if it was a coincidence that we just happened to get the, 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 the hemorrhoids and the rats whenever the ark of, of their god came into our city? So they decided to put it to a test. They would put it on the, on the back of a cart. This isn't God telling them to do this. They're just trying to figure this out. They would hitch it up to two cows who have never pulled a cart before that were still nursing. And they took their mothers and put them in the opposite direction. And they said, if the cows take the ark back to the land of Israel, we will know it is their God. But if they go to their, to their mothers, then we know it was just a coincidence. And the cows walked straight towards Israel, lowing as they went. And the Philistines knew that they had been struck by the hand of God. Now, when the Israelites saw the cows and the ark, oh, I forgot to mention the presents. They made presents. They made golden hemorrhoids, which I can't imagine being the goldsmith. He was like, well, all right, who's going to be my model? You know, like, I don't want that at all. But that's what they did. They made golden hemorrhoids and they made golden rats to send back to Israel that the, the be an offering, like, please leave us alone. And that's the thing with every other God they've ever worshipped. They always worship the other God to leave them alone. Our God is the only God who wants to be with his people, who wants to have a relationship. He's the only one who tells us to pray, if you will draw near to me, then I will draw near to you. And he says that. It's in James. It's 4, 8, I believe. So if you are struggling with being close to God, all you got to do is draw near to him. And if you look at the words in the Greek, it makes it seem like well, in English, it's the same word, be near and be near. But if you look in the Greek, it makes it seem like if you just take a step, he is instantly there with you. If you just attempt to get close to God, he is there. Because the chasm between you and God is just your own sin. And that, that chasm can be covered in a prayer. All you got to do is say, God, I want you. All you got to do is call out to him. He is there. He wants to be with you all the time, and you are separating yourself when you sin from him. So all you got to do is turn and repent. 
Say, God, I'm done with this. I don't want this anymore. I want you. And you don't even have to physically get rid of it yet. He's automatically there with you because his desire is to be with you. He wants you, but he doesn't want to force you, right? My kids, they want me there. But when they're mad at me for some reason, because, well, my, my one and a half year old, which is probably the reason my wife isn't in this room right now, he got mad at me today because I put his bottle in the bag to come here tonight and I didn't just give it to him. It had nothing in it, but he was expecting something to be in it. And he, you know, he eventually got it, but he got mad because I didn't give him something he wanted right away. And you know, when kids get mad, they, 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 they say stuff. Like he didn't say anything because he's one and a half, but you, you see older kids say, oh, I don't, I don't want to be with you anymore. I don't want you right now. And it hurts, and that's why they're saying it. They're saying it to hurt you. It's not that they don't actually want you, because if you said, okay, I'm leaving, they'd start crying because you left. Because they actually do want you, and you want to be with them. But my kids don't have a choice. They don't get to go, I don't want you, Dad. I'm like, too bad, I live here. You know, it's my house. You get stuck with me, and you're staying with me, and you don't have anything to say about it. But that's not the way God operates. You tell God, I don't want you. He's like, all right, let's see what it looks like without me. And he'll step back. CPS doesn't come after God. He'll step back and let you get worked over by the world. And he pokes his head back in. You still don't want me? That's what the whole book of Judges is about about the, the people who were doing what was right in their own eyes and stepping away from God saying, we don't want you, and him going, all right. Now their latest, we don't want you, is after all that happened with the ark, them going to Samuel and saying, hey, Samuel, we want a king just like all the other nations. They're telling Samuel, we don't want to be ruled by God. We want a king that we can see and we can touch and we can smell. They didn't, they didn't sell, they smell. They said see and touch. But, you know, if you can see him and touch him, you're going to smell him. They wanted to be like everybody else. Samuel was offended. What are you talking about? God is your king. Nobody else has God as a king. You have God as a king. Why would you go against him in this? Why would you rebel against them? And God said to Samuel's heart, calm down. They're not rebelling against you. They're rebelling against me. Give them a king. Let them see what it's like. And so Samuel, of course, listens to the Lord. We don't actually read anything about Samuel doing, we don't read about Samuel doing anything bad in the Bible. He always listens to God. He gets upset pretty frequently in the scriptures because he's dealing with sinners, you know, and that's easy to do. You get upset too when you deal with people all day long, don't you? Right? Because they, they make mistakes. They're not that nice. Some of them probably smell bad. I say that because I don't have a sense of smell. So if you smell bad, we can be friends. I won't smell you. I won't know. Um, just come up to me later. We'll talk. But my wife's around. She's got a good nose. You may want to give her some space. Um, but, but the idea is like God loves us and we just go, meh, is there anybody else? Can we have someone else, please? Like it's completely offensive to the Lord. But he is gracious and he steps back. It's like, you want a king? Here's a king. And he chooses a man named Saul, Right? He looks like a king. He's one of the few men in the Bible that the Bible says, oh, this guy's good looking, right? He say that about Joseph uh, when he's in Potiphar's house, that Potiphar's wife wanted him because he was a good looking kind of guy. It says about Saul here, he's a good looking kind of guy. And I think Absalom, David's son, is, is good looking. David's described as ruddy. And I, I guess that's good. I don't know what ruddy means. Like, do you put him in the back of a boat? I don't know. What do you do with ruddy? But, 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 he, but Saul is good looking. And it says from his head up, he was taller than any other man. So I'm guessing he's either got a big head or a long neck. Big head goes a whole lot better with his personality, though. So they make Saul the king. God tells Samuel. Samuel chooses Saul and says, Saul is your king. And then everybody else goes, Saul, where is he? He wasn't even there. When God chose him, he was hiding amongst the luggage. And they had to go find him. 
And they had to ask God, where is Saul hiding? He's like, oh, Saul's over with the luggage. Samuel's like, who's with the luggage? And they go, where is he? Is he behind that giant lollipop? No, he is that giant lollipop. Go get him, bring him back here, make him king. So they make him king. Some guys go, oh, I don't want Saul to be king. What's Saul going to do for us? And then Samuel says, everybody just go home. We're done now. We're like, the, the day is done. I'm going, I'm going to bed. And then we get to chapter 11. Then Hash, the Amorite, came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, make a covenant with us and we shall serve you. Okay, Nahash and Jabesh, they, they so close together, it misses, makes me up. So, uh, so Nahash the Ammonite, remember Ammon uh, was one of the sons of Lot that he had with his daughter while he was drunk, right? That Moab and Ammon are always enemies of Israel. Um, and, and we see them pop up every once in a while. Actually, I take that back because Ruth was a Moabite, Moabitess. Uh, and, and so, but if you're dealing with the country, they're enemies, uh, but Ruth was, was, was redeemable. There's no Ammonite in the scripture that is redeemable. They're all enemies of Israel the whole time. So this guy comes up to a, a city called Jabesh Gilead. It's just on the other side of the Jordan from, from them. And, and, and they say, uh, they, they camp against them like they're going to make war. They're going to lay the siege. And Jabesh Gilead, they know, they know they're not going to win. So they try to make a deal, right? They says, all right, make a covenant with us. We will serve you. It's like, you don't kill us. We'll, we'll be your servants. We'll be your slaves. We'll pay you tribute. We'll, we'll do whatever you want. Just do whatever you want. Just let us know. And the hash the Ammonite answered and says, on this condition, I will make a covenant with you that I may put out your, all your right eyes and bring a reproach to Israel. He says, all right, I'll make a deal with you, but first I got to pluck out all of your right eyes. You can keep your left eye, but not your right eye. I'm plucking that out. What, what, what's he trying to do? What's, what's the point of plucking out some of these eyes? That's just mean. He's trying to make a name for himself. He's trying to prove himself a tough guy. I don't know if he's trying to prove himself to somebody back home, but he's definitely trying to make a statement. He's trying to earn his stripes in the military, take out somebody else, and, and, and talk mean to him. Well, the elders of Besh said to him, hold off for seven days. I think that's hilarious, right? It's like, oh, no, they're kept against us. What do you want to do? Uh, well, let's make, it, let's make a deal. All right, I'll make a deal with you. Pluck out all your right eyes. Give us a week. Let us talk, let us think this through, right? The elders of Jabesh said, hold off for seven days that we may send messengers to all the territory of Israel. And then if there is no one to save us, we will come out to you. Why would he agree to that? But he does, right? He says, okay, I'll give you, I'll give you your week. Well, the reason is he's, it's under a siege. You know how long sieges last? Until the people inside were out of food and water. So, so this guy's like, well, I could be here for months or years even if they got lots of food and water inside. So actually, a week's not so bad. We'll wait a week, and then you give up to us, and then I can claim my victory. My victory. So the messengers came to Gebeah of Saul and told the news to the hearing of the people. So Gebeah is, is where Saul lives. They, told, they tell everybody about it and what's going on. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. So they're all crying, saying, oh, no, these people are coming against the people in Israel. And what are we going to do about it? Nothing. We, we have nothing. In the book of Judges, for the last 400 years, they've got beaten by every single enemy in the area. The Moabites, the Philistines over and over again, and then they would be subject, they would pay tribute to, and then God would send a judge, because they cried out to him finally, that God would send a judge to rescue them, and he would rescue all of Israel, and then, you know, the next chapter, they get taken over by somebody else, because they don't keep up their relationship with the Lord. You might feel like your world is like the book of Judges. Every single day, it's a new problem. You get washed over. It's like you're, 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 you're in the ocean and the wave crashes down on you. You get your head just to take a little breath and the next wave gets you. And it just pounds you again and again and again. My first question, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Not do you, do you come to church, do you pray, do you read the Bible? Those are great things. But if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, reading the Bible is not going to make any sense. Praying is going to be empty. Coming to church You'll feel good in church, but once you get home, it'll be like, it didn't stick. You know why you feel good in church, by the way, even though you don't feel good at home? The Holy Spirit is here amongst the brethren. 
If he's not living in you, he's living in all of us. And everybody who's close to somebody with the Holy Spirit is either blessed by him or upset by him. And so if you're blessed when you're hanging out at church and you're not at home, it's because the Holy Spirit's here at church, but he's not in your life. You need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not just being around the people who do. You need it personally. That's what the people of Israel did not have at that time. They did not have a personal relationship with God. They just cried out to him when they were in trouble. And if the only time that you cry out to God is when you're in trouble and God wants to have a relationship with you, why would he ever let you out of the hard times? It's the only time you talk to him. It's the only time. And so if, he, if that's the case, then he's always going to let you have hard times just so you'll say hi, help. He's like, okay, I'll help. And then once you're feeling good, then you forget about God. That's what happened in the book of Judges. And then the next thing comes. You're like, oh, no, I need help again, God. So here's what you do. Praise the Lord when times are good. And you'll get to avoid a whole lot. Doesn't mean your life will be easy from then on. It'll still be hard. Stuff will still come up. But the difference is the hard things that come up when you have a relationship with the Lord will grow you in the Lord. It's going to be like tests in school, right? That, that help you study what you've learned so that it's in your mind and in your heart so you can say it later on. Oh, well, maybe it didn't happen with you. People sometimes take tests and they don't remember the stuff. But the whole point is to remember it, to learn stuff. And trials in this life are designed by the Lord to build patience, and patience must have its perfect work in your life so that you can be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Would you like to be perfect? Would you like to be complete? Would you like to lack nothing? It comes through the growing of patience, and the growing of patience comes by trials. The word patience is sometimes translated as long-suffering. That's what it actually means. If you're like, oh, I'm a patient person, that means you can suffer for a long time. How many people want to say, oh, I'm a patient person now? I am good at suffering for a long time. And you're like, why would anyone want to suffer for a long time? Ask any parent, because every parent has suffered for a long time. It happens. But because we suffer through these trials, we learn to be patient. What is patience other than suffering for a long time? It is relying on the Lord. You know why people who suffer for a long time can suffer for a long time and have patience? It's because they know that whatever suffering they're going through is only temporary. It might be like two hours temporary, two days temporary, two years temporary, two decades temporary, you know, two lifetimes, no, not two lifetimes, one lifetime temporary, but it will never go past the rest of your life. Doesn't that sound great? Whatever you're suffering with, it'll end when you die, if not before. And, and that might seem like a long time, like, but, but if I suffer for the rest of my life, I've got what, 50, 60 years left if I'm lucky, or if, if I eat like my wife tells me to, 50, 60 years, right? But that's nothing compared to eternity. Nothing. Would you rather suffer for 50, 60 years and go to heaven or not suffer at all for the next 50, 60 years and go to hell for eternity? It's your choice. And the thing is, it's not really your choice because the Bible also says it rains on the just and the unjust. You're going to suffer whether you choose the Lord or not. So it's suffer now and have a good life later or suffer now and have a bad life later. It's up to you. But the point is we need that personal relationship with the Lord to get through. If you feel like you can't get through whatever your current suffering is, go to Jesus. Just like that song said that we, that we sang earlier, take me back to where I began. Go back to the beginning. What's the beginning? The gospel of Jesus Christ is the beginning. The Bible says that we are sinners. We are all sinners. There is no one righteous, not one. And the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die because of our sin. But because Jesus loves us so much, he died for us. 
even death on the cross. He died so that we could live. And then because he's God, he raised again on the third day. If we would just believe in him, believe him that he's God, and call out, we would be saved. The Bible says believe in your heart and call, and call out with your voice. Call out with your mouth and you'll be saved. And that's it. We just need to believe him. Go back to the beginning. Go back to the gospel. And if you have that gospel in your heart, there is no trial that's too big for you. There is no suffering that is too great. Trials will be big. Sufferings will be great, but not too big and not too great because you have the biggest God to stand with you. Anything, everything, trust in him. Verse 4, I don't have verse 4. Nope, I have verse 5. Now there was Saul coming behind the herd from the field. So Saul's just coming and he was working. He's the king now, but he didn't know what to do as king. They've never had a king before. There's no royal palace to go to. No Buckingham Palace, no White House. He's just like, I guess I'll just go home then and get back to work. So he's plowing the field be, be, uh, behind his herd or, yeah, because it's a flock of sheep, not a herd of sheep. So this must be cows. Have you heard of cows? Of course I've heard of cows. Um, so he's, he's behind his cows. So he's probably plowing his field. He comes in, he hears everybody uh, everybody crying, and, and he's like, what's going on? What troubles the people that they weep? And they told him the words of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard the news, and his anger was greatly aroused. Okay, the Spirit comes upon him here. This is the Holy Spirit coming upon him. Right, we have, we have the Holy Spirit can, can live inside of us, and, but then the Holy Spirit can come upon us. The Holy Spirit was given to the disciples in John chapter 20 when Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit, and he breathed on them. I think if Jesus said it, it happened, right? But they don't speak in tongues then. They don't speak in tongues until Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And, and so that's a different thing. The Holy Spirit moves within Saul, and Saul's anger is aroused. This is not Saul's anger. This is God's anger through Saul. These people are mistreating my people. we got to do something about it. So he took a yoke of oxen and cut them into pieces and sent them throughout the territory of Israel by the hands of messengers. I bet they're the oxen he was using to plow the field. They were right there, right? He cuts them into pieces, sends them out and say, saying, whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so shall it be done to his oxen. Come fight with us or we're going to cut up your oxen. That, 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 that's a real thing, right? So that's what he did. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people. You see how it starts with the, with, with the Spirit of God falling on one person, and then the fear of the Lord fell on everybody else. God works through one person that spreads it out. Who knows if that one person is you? When the Spirit comes upon you next time you act, it's not like, like some movies might portray where a Spirit comes upon you and you have no control over yourself. Right? We don't get possessed by the Holy Spirit. He lives inside of us. He empowers us. He encourages us. But he doesn't do things to us. He doesn't use our bodies like we're puppets. Those are just movies. And the demons do those types of things. But the Holy Spirit's a gentleman. He's, he's, he basically says, hey, I want to do this powerful thing. You want to do it with me. And we're doing it together. If the Holy Spirit's speaking through me, and I, I believe he is, I hope he is. It's not like I have no control over what I say. But I have, I, I have the Holy Spirit moving through the scriptures and through my heart to give you his word. And if you ever disagree with me, that's fine. But if you disagree with what the scriptures say and what the Holy Spirit says through the scriptures, then you've got to take that up with the Lord. You can argue with me all you want. And all I can say is, I don't know, it's in the scriptures. Talk to God about it. All I do is tell you what I believe I see God saying in these things. And you're not supposed to follow me anyway. Follow the Lord. I'm only temporary here. Who knows if that temporary is just this week or a month or a year or for the rest of my life. Who knows? But that's just temporary because eventually it'll be somebody else. Follow the Lord. Always the Lord, only the Lord. 
verse, whatever verse that is, eight. And when and when he numbered when he numbered them in Bezek, which is a weird town name, but anyway, the children of Israel were three hundred thousand, and the men of Judah were thirty thousand. Why are the men of Israel and the men of Judah already split here? That's kind of strange, right? But you see that national identity where Judah kind of separate a little bit from Israel, and that's going to become way important three kings later when Rehoboam tries to take over for Solomon. But, but there's already an identity split of the people of Judah and the rest of the people of Israel. So that's just a, pay attention, and that's a little foreshadowing there. And they said to the messengers who came, Thus you shall say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, you shall have help. It's like, we'll be there in the morning. If it's afternoon, it's too late. But we'll be there tomorrow. Uh, and then they said, and then the messengers came and reported to the men of Jabesh. And they were glad. Therefore, the men of Jabesh said, tomorrow we will come out to you and you may do with us whatever seems good to you. So the messengers come back to the city. They say, hey, we'll be out to tomorrow before it gets hot. And then the people in the city send messengers to the enemy camped around them saying, all right, we'll come out tomorrow and you can do whatever you want then. They're like, oh, good. We get to pluck out some eyes now. Like, is that really what you'd want to do as a soldier? You want to pluck people's eyes out? I don't know about that. Verse 11. So it was on the next day that Saul put the people in three companies, and they came in the midst of the camp in the morning watch, and killed Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it happened that those who survived were scattered, so that two of them were so not so that no two of them were left together. So Saul comes with his army of people that he, he gathered by sending his ox out, right, as, as, as a pretty brutal object lesson. And says, hey, come together. And they go in three companies. They beat the Amorites. They beat them so bad that not even two of the ones who are alive are together. They've all ran separate ways. Decisive victory. The people, then the people said to Samuel, who is he who said, shall Saul reign over us? Bring them in that we shall put them to death. So after the victory, this is a great political point for Saul. He's now a victorious warrior hero as he leads his people into battle. And like, remember those guys in the last chapter who said, who's this guy Saul's going to reign after us? Let's bring those guys out now and kill them. Because they didn't believe in Big Head Saul, and Big Headed Saul just did a great victory. Yay, long live Big Headed Saul, right? Although this time, Saul's a good guy. The, 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 this... this crown has not yet gone to his head. Saul said, verse 13, not a man shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has accomplished salvation in Israel. He says, hey, let's not spoil our victory here by killing our own people. He extends mercy and grace. These are the people who didn't want him to be king. Now, anybody else would have them killed because they pose a threat. And once you have the power, because after they won this battle, they have the political power, they got the clout. It's like if they're going to do it at any time, kill off the competition, this is the time. But Saul, in mercy and grace, says there's been enough bloodshed for today. Just let them live. People are going to speak evil of you. They're going to say things about you that aren't true, that, that you wish no one had ever said or even thought or heard about you. Your desire is going to be to do something about it. What does the Lord say? He says, vengeance is mine. It's in Romans 12. He claims vengeance. So if you try to get revenge, you are stealing from the Lord. He'll take care of it. Remember when the people grumbled against Aaron? Did God take care of it? Yeah. Moses says, all right, let's try this. Everyone put their staffs down. And we'll see which one grows in the morning. Aaron's was the only one that budded. Produce fruit. How cool would that be to have a walking stick that's producing fruit? You get a little hungry, you don't have to stop. Just keep going. It's the ultimate trail mix. <laughs> and so, so whenever there is a rebellion against the Lord, the Lord takes care of it. If there is a rebellion against you, and you are not with the Lord, well, then I guess you're going to have to take care of it. But if you're with the Lord, then you never have to worry. If someone comes against you and you are with the Lord, the Lord's going to take care of it. So relax. Extend mercy and grace. 
Is there a problem? Yep. Is God, is God going to take care of it? Yep. And you just keep doing what God has told you to do. And that's the thing. People say, what do I do about this? What do I do? This? What did God tell you to do? Whatever God told you to do, do that. How long do I do that? Until God tells you to do something else? Just trust him and trust his ability to communicate with you. Because a lot of us say, well, I don't know if I can hear the Lord. I don't think I can hear him. If God told me this, like, what if I missed it? Is God incapable of reaching you? Does God not have your phone number? You know, like, if, if he wants you, he'll text you. Whatever it is, he'll get a hold of you in any way that he wants to, but be sure that when God speaks, you will know it's him speaking. And you might go, oh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, remember Gideon? He didn't believe. He, didn't want, he needed the test. He says, well, if it's you, I'm putting this fleece out and, and make the fleece wet and the ground dry. And then God did just that. And then the next day, it's like, well, maybe uh, do it the opposite this time. Make the ground, maybe it was just a coincidence. You know, and make, do it the other make the ground wet and the fleece dry. And God did that too. That's what Gideon needed to believe the Lord. Because what happened after God did those things? He marched out to fight against the Midianites, and, and he got to a, a, a river, and God says, you got too many people here. Get rid of some of them. And anybody who wanted to go home, go home. If you don't want to fight, go home. Can you imagine the army saying that today? You go into the army. You're about to march in the battle, right? You fly to wherever the battle's happening now, and, and, and the commander goes, hey, if you're scared and you want to go home, just go home. It's fine. Can you imagine the United States military telling its soldiers that? That's what Gideon did. And then God said, you still have too many people. So let them all drink water and watch how they drink. If they cup it and put it in their mouths, keep them. If they stick their head in the water, let them go home. And then he was down to 300 people. And then God said, all right, here's how you're going to win the battle. They're down in the valley. Go stand on the cliffs around them. And you're thinking, yeah, we'll throw rocks at them. I'm like, no, 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 no rocks. I want you to, do is, I want you to hold a, a, a torch in a jar in one hand and a trumpet in the other. And you're like, well, I don't have a third hand to hold my sword. No, no, just, just these two things is fine. Then on the command, break the jar so your torch is lit and start blowing the trumpet. And then what? No, that's it. That's all the instructions you got. You, can you imagine, like, that's how God wins his battles. And if he did that for the Midianites, or for the Midianites, for Gideon, guess what he'll do for you? But remember that Gideon followed all of those instructions because he asked God to prove himself, and God did. If you ask God for a sign, and God is gracious enough to give it to you. You better do what he says. You better do everything he says to the letter without doubt. Because God has showed up and he's given you instructions. If you're not sure it's God, then just ask God, please be more clear. I'm doubting myself. And be clear, I'm doubting you that you are speaking to me. Please for sure. Make it abundantly clear that you are telling me what to do. Because I bet what God's telling you to do is scary. You don't want to do it. Because if you did want to do it, God wouldn't have to tell you to do it. Right? I never have to tell my kids, finish up your ice cream. <laughs> we don't want any leftovers. You know, they'll finish up their ice cream on their own. They don't have to be told that. If it's something you want to do, you're naturally going to want to do it. When God tells you to do something, it's because you're scared. You don't want to do it. God says, well, you got to do it anyway. You ever go, why? Why do we have to do that? My kids are in the why phase. They think like, you know, the eight-year-old and the 10-year-old think that they can just like, if you tell me why, I can tell you why I don't have to do it. Right? Oh, you're laughing because that probably happens to you too. Yeah, long suffering, that's right. You know, it's just like, well, let me let me let me try to talk my way out of this. And then and then the conversation just turns to, I'm your dad and I told you to do something. Go do it. 
I had to teach my kids a phrase when they were much younger. So the phrase was, yes, dad, I'll obey so I don't get spanked. And that helped a whole lot of conversations be much, much shorter. And so, so the idea, though, is if God's telling you to do something, just, just say, yes, dad, I'll obey so I don't get spanked. God wants you to do it. It's not going to be easy. But God wants you to do it anyway. It's, it's good for you. So Saul didn't put them to death. In verse 14, And Samuel said to the people, Come, let's go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. So we're going to talk again, another, like a coronation. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they made sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Now that he's had this great accomplishment, now that he's acted in a kingly role, let's make it official. Let's make it good. Let's put this one on TV, right? So they do that. They make the big coronation, and now Samuel has something to say. This is chapter 12. We're going to do two chapters tonight just because we're feeling good. Now Samuel said to all Israel, Indeed, I have heeded your voice in all that you said to me and have made a king over you. You asked for a king, guys. I gave you a king. And now here is the king walking before you. And I am old and gray-headed, and look, my sons are with you. And I have walked before you from my childhood to this day. Here I am. He's saying, hey, realize that I've, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been in charge of Israel as a judge. You rejected me and asked for a king, so here's your king. The people who have done well and have integrity have no need to walk their integrity before you. They just say, look at what I've already done. Witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed, whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I, have I received any bride, bribe with which to blind my eyes? I will restore it to you. He says, does anybody have anything to say against me? And can you imagine the politicians saying that today? Can you imagine the president or, and, and the vice president getting up during their debate and asking the American people directly, where have I done wrong? Show me something I've done wrong. I'll make it right. You know, they, like, there'd be a long line out the building and people say, oh, I know what you've done wrong. Samuel has lived his life so well that everybody in Israel knows he's a good guy and that he's always done the right thing. Since he was a child, he was before them. He was in the limelight, serving under Eli. Then when Eli died and then Eli's sons died, Samuel was the guy. Everybody knows him. Everybody's seen him. Everybody has seen his integrity. So much so that he can ask the entire nation, is there anybody here whom I have wronged? Bring your accusation and I will make it right. Like that's, that's a big thing. And they said, verse, verse 4, You have not cheated us or oppressed us. You have not taken anything from any man's hand. They admit he's righteous. He didn't do any of that bad stuff. Verse 5, Then he said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness to this day that you have not found anything in my hand. He says, You said nothing. God is witness that you've said nothing. Do you agree? And they answered him, He is witness. Like, yeah, we agree. You've done nothing. We got nothing against you, Samuel. And you can see Samuel's logic. It's like, then why did you ask for a king? Verse 6 says, Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. So after he talks about his own history of nothing, he goes into their history. It's like God raised up Aaron and Moses to bring you out of Egypt. Bring, who has brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. Now verse 7, Now therefore stand still, that I may reason with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and your fathers. He's like, let's talk about what God's done for you so far. And a lot of times we have to remember what God's done for us so far. We forget because we see the trial in front of us. It's like, oh no, what am I going to do? How am I going to get by? And, and, and God's just saying, hey, remember what I've done for you so far. 
if I did all of that for you then, do you think I'm going to let you fail now? Do you think I'm going to let you fall now so hard that I can't catch you? Do you think God does that for us? We know he has a plan. We know he's all powerful. We know he's all knowing. We know he's everywhere, right? Do you really think that God's going to do all these miracles in our past? And if you talk to each other, you're going to hear about the miracles in each other's lives. I recommend that, by the way. After service, find somebody you know or don't know and say, has God performed any miracles in your past? Can you tell me about one of them? And find out what God is doing amongst his people here. But God doesn't do all of those miracles in your past so that he lets you fail now. All of those trials in your past, all of those miracles that deliver you from your trials in your past are designed, are meant so that right here, right now, in face of this trial, you can go, I am not afraid. I know my God is with me because of what he's already done. It is good to remember. And you will see many times in the scriptures that the people talking to the people of Israel will go back to slavery in Egypt and start there again and talk about what God has done since. When Jacob had gone into Egypt and when your fathers cried out to the Lord, the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. He skips a lot. He skips the whole desert period. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them in the hands of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, into the land of the Philistines, into the hand of the king of Moab. And they fought against them. And they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and Asherahs. But now deliver us from the hand of our enemies, and we will serve you. And the Lord sent Jerubbabel, Badan, Jephath, and Samuel, like this to me, to, and deliver you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you dwelt in safety. And when you saw that Nahash, king of the Amorites, come against you, you said to me, No, but the king shall reign, against, reign over us. And when the Lord your God was your king. Like he just recounts the book of Judges. I love the book of Exodus. Like what did God do for the people while they were in Egypt? He sent the plagues to the Egyptians, yet the people of Israel had light when the Egyptians had darkness. Their cows lived when the Egyptians died. They, they, they didn't have the boils. The 10 plagues affected the Egyptians and the Hebrews who were just watching from the sidelines. Then when Pharaoh finally let them go, God showed up as a pillar of clouds and led them to the sea. When the Egyptian army was coming behind them, they thought they were going to die, but then the pillar of cloud moved, became a pillar of fire and separated the Egyptians from the Hebrews while the Red Sea parted and they walked across on dry land. If anyone saw miracles, it was the people leaving Egypt that day. Then when the Egyptian army tried to cross, the sea came and consumed them all. They were safe. They had no reason to run because no one was chasing them anymore. They went to the mountain of God. They heard God speak. The Exodus chapter 20 where God gives them the commandments, that's not Moses writing it down and telling them about it. That is the word of God spoken from the fiery mountain to all two million people. They heard his voice. Can you imagine what it would be like to hear his voice? We'd love to hear his voice. They got to hear it. They got to see the fire on the mountain and they rejected him there. They said to Moses, you go talk to him and then you tell him what he says and then we'll obey you, which they didn't, obviously. As soon as he was come to the mountain, they're like, I think Moses died. I mean, he went up, the, the mountain's on fire. He went up into it. Let's get naked, build a golden calf and dance around it, right? That's what they did. And Moses had to come down and grind it, grind it to ash and feed it to the people. It's like, that's what, you, that's, that's what your God's like. Then, for 40 years, God led them through the desert. A pillar of cloud during the day, a pillar of fire by night. Bread fell from the sky. Meat was blown in by the wind. Water came out of rocks. Their, their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out. God took care of them. He provided for them. He did so many miracles every single day for those guys. And they grumbled and grumbled and grumbled. And you're like, yeah, those guys are stupid. How much do we grumble against the Lord when one thing isn't right? When our comfort is threatened, it's not even taken away. Our comfort's just threatened. We're going, God, where are you? 
You gotta take care of this, God. I don't like this person I'm seeing on TV right now. Don't make that person president. You have to trust in the Lord. God is a good God. And he will take care of you no matter what. But he's not going to take care of you the way you want him to take care of you. He's going to do the right thing. He's going to do the right thing. And so no matter what you want done, trust the Lord to do the right thing. It's him. It's always him. It's only been him. Now, as Samuel's talking, verse 13, you wanted the king, here's your king. Now, therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen and whom you have desired. Notice it's not God choosing, although God did choose him. He says, you chose him because you desired him. And take note, the Lord has set the king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the command of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. He says, you have a choice now. If you and your king obey God, you guys will get to follow God. You'll still have your king, which you can see, and you will have your God, whom you cannot. If you obey, you'll have both. Verse 15, however, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. If you rebel against God, you're going to get the same, the same thing your fathers got in the desert. How many people that left Egypt got to make it to the Holy Land? Two. Just two. And it wasn't even Moses and Aaron although they were 80 and 86 at the time. Well, you didn't think they'd make it, but they did live to like 120, right? But just Joshua and Caleb made it into the promised land because they believed God. Did Moses believe God? Yeah, he believed them, but he didn't represent him right. He took his anger out on the people instead of listening to the Lord and obeying the Lord. He didn't obey. God said, speak to the rock. He struck the rock. What does it say? If you don't obey, you get the wrath. Obey now, is it obeying God when you agree with him? That's no, just agreeing with him. That's easy, right? How many times do I have to tell my kids, get in the van, we're going to get ice cream? Just the once, right? They're going to obey because they want what I'm going to give them. If they don't want what, I can't even think of where they wouldn't want to go. They're happy to go anywhere. But if, I, if they don't want to go, let's say to the doctors or the dentist or whatever, they tell them to get in, then they obey anyway. You know, it's just like when, when they go, okay, dad, and they go do whatever it is I told them to do, that's obedience. Obeying when you don't want to obey, that's obedience. Why would God tell you to do something you don't want to do? Why do we tell our kids to do stuff they don't want to do? Why do we tell them to make their beds, clean their rooms, brush their teeth? Because it's good for them. We are trying to install good and godly habits in them so that when they grow up, they do these things naturally. God's doing the same thing to you. Whenever God tells you to do something, do it. It is for your own benefit. It's for your own good. He just happens to know better than us. I wonder why. Verse 16, now therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is, not, is today not the wheat harvest? I will call to the Lord and he will send thunder and rain that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, that you, what you, which you have done in the sight of the Lord, asking for a king for yourselves. So Samuel called to the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day and the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Wheat harvest, it's the end of the summer. It's a hot day. It's supposed to be hot. No rain forecasted for a while, right? Just like what happens in our August. No rain, clear skies. It feels like the surface of the sun outside. And, and, and Samuel goes, all right, here's the proof that what I'm saying is from the Lord. Here comes the rain and thunder. And all of a sudden, the clouds come out of nowhere. Rain pours down, thunder booms, lightning strikes. Everyone freaks out. What is this? He just changed the whole sky. It's the Lord. He was proving himself to be there. And the miracle that he did, the sign that he did here, shows that he supported. He, he, he supported everything that Samuel said. Everything Samuel said was from him. Now, God doesn't do that sort of thing anymore. Not because he can't. But in the past, according to the book of Hebrews, God spoke through our forefathers. 
through the prophets in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. We don't need God to do these miraculous signs just to show us he is because we have the son, his word, and his Holy Spirit to testify that God is true. They had their law, they had their prophets, they had their signs, this, their trifecta of witnesses. We have Jesus Christ, we have the word of God, we have the Holy Spirit as his witnesses that God the Father is right and he is true. At verse 19, and all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die. For we have added to all of our sins the evil of asking a king for ourselves. They finally get it. We shouldn't have asked for a king, but you got one. Sometimes you sin, and there are consequences, and you don't get to get rid of the consequences. They, they kept their king Samuel, right? And how long is it going to be before Samuel does stuff that's not good? Like the next chapter. It comes real soon. If you sin and there is a result, a consequence of your sin, God's forgiving you for the sin, but the consequence lasts then you have to live with that consequence. You don't hate it. You accept it. Because what did God say? If you and your king follow the Lord, then you will get to obey the Lord. You will get to follow him. God has allowances for us. It doesn't mean we should have done them in the first place. If you're at that place where you think, should I sin, should I not, don't sin. But if you have sinned and there are consequences, then you might have to live with those consequences for the rest of your life. They are reminders to trust and follow God. You'll get those reminders two ways. One, by doing it and trusting him, and by not doing it and trusting him and seeing what happens. They're both excellent reminders. Verse 20, then Samuel said to the people, do not fear you have done all this wickedness, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. That's what you do. If you fail, if you sin, then just start following the Lord with all of your heart and serving him. And do not turn aside, for then you will go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. Anytime you try to get something that isn't God, it's going to come up empty. Every sin you go after thinking this will satisfy you. It doesn't satisfy. Solomon's tried them all. He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes because he tried every single one and none of them filled. And I watched this, this, this uh, documentary a while back. I forgot what it's called, but it's about this comedian, like in the shadow of Jerry Seinfeld, right? Jerry Seinfeld is a comedian. He made, he made his own show or whatever. This guy's like on his heels working, doing the same things that, that Jerry was doing and he's getting more popular. And there's one, there's, there's one scene where he's on like some talk show. I can't remember which one it was. And he does his bit and people laugh or whatever. And he goes backstage and starts complaining about how bad the audience was. His heart wasn't in it. He was smiling on stage, kind of. But when he got back, it was all grimaces. And, and, and he said that he had everything he ever wanted. But he was still miserable. Like, this guy's a comedian. His job is to make people laugh, and he is miserable after getting everything he wants. I never wanted to evangelize to my TV so much before. It's like, you need Jesus? Because the thing is, when we chase after something that isn't God, the happiest we will ever be is when we're about to get it. Because once we get it, it falls apart in our hands. It's not real. It doesn't satisfy. You ever buy something thinking, oh, this will be great, and you get it, and it's just a piece of junk, and it breaks the first day, or you just, it doesn't, it doesn't like, it's not as good as I thought it was going to be. It looked bigger in the picture, right? That's what everything is like that's not Jesus. Whatever you're chasing after, if it's not Jesus, it won't satisfy. I don't know a single person who's rich who decides I don't want to work anymore. They work harder than everybody else. How much do you need? Just another million, right? They're chasing after something they're never going to get. They're never going to get satisfaction. That's what we really want. We just want, we just want to be satisfied with what we have. And if it's anything other than Jesus, it's not. You know why? Because it's not enough. 
There's no, there's no money that's enough. There's no pleasure that's enough. Nothing that's enough except Jesus. Jesus is the only thing that's big enough. And even though I chase after Jesus and I get him, I still want more of him. I want to understand more of his word. I want to live more like him. I want to be more like him every single day. Do I do it? I hope so. I fail a lot. But then God just picks me back up, puts me back on my feet and says, let's go. And we keep going. Verse 22, for the Lord will not forsake his people. Amen to that. For his great namesake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. This God says, I chose you because it pleased me to choose you. Not because you're great, not because you're wonderful, not because you're strong or smart. And the Jews, they are smart. You know why they're smart? Because God blessed them. He made them that way. But he didn't choose them because they're smart. He chose them because he wanted to choose them. God has also chosen you. We're not the Jews. We're not the same type of thing that God's chosen. God chose the Jews, but he has also chosen you. He has chosen you to be his people, not the same as the Jews, completely different. In my mind, it's better. We get to be the bride of Christ. We, we're looking forward to a wedding feast in heaven that's seven years long. Can you imagine eating for seven years? Like, that'll be good. You think Thanksgiving's going to be good tomorrow? Just you wait. That's going to be a better feast. We get to be with him. After those seven years, we get to ride the horses. Those better be some strong horses. After seven years, I'm going to put that horse to the test. And we get to come back and help the Lord retake this earth. How cool is that? We are chosen for something mighty. And if God chooses us, he will not forsake us. And he doesn't choose us because we are great. It's because he is great. So you don't have to rely on your own strength to please the Lord. You don't have to rely on your own smarts to please the Lord. He doesn't need what we have. We just need what he has. And he offers it to us freely. That's it. 23, moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. It's like, I'm going to keep praying for you, but that's just because I don't want to sin by stopping praying for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. You have a choice here. You can follow God or do your own thing. You know what happens when you do your own thing. It's happened to you time and time again. And their choice is the same as your choice today. Are you going to follow God with whatever he's told you tonight, or are you going to do your own thing, do things your own way? You do things your own way, you will be swept away in your sin. And God will be waiting for you to call out again, to rescue you, put you back on square one, and start over again. You ever play shoots and ladders? It's like that. You do your own thing, you're going down one of those shoots. You, you rest on the Lord, you get to go up the ladder. You trust God, God picks you up and puts you where you belong. That's what he does. And where do you belong? With him. With him. Right? In the next, in the next chapter, we're going to see that, that Saul chooses men to run alongside his chariots. You know who run alongside the chariots of kings? The foot soldiers do. You know who rides in the chariots of kings? His children. God doesn't want you to run alongside him. God wants you to ride in with him. He's going to pick you up and put you in. Because he has chosen you. All you got to do is say, okay, let's do it. Let's go. Let's pray. My Lord Jesus, you are an amazing God. Thank you so much for this time that we could open up your word and read about this stuff in history, Lord, but it still makes sense to us today. And people who say that the Bible is hard to understand, Lord, don't just sit down and read it. Or maybe they don't trust your Holy Spirit to, to tell them about it. Lord, we want to trust your Holy Spirit. It's not about how smart we are. It's not like we figured this out on our own merit. Lord, we have just come to you and have sought your face and have sought a relationship with you. And because we have that, you have explained everything to us, Jesus. And there is no mystery in the universe that's off limits, except for maybe the mystery of your coming. 
But we know that too, Lord, will be revealed in its time. And so we pray that we would have our eyes set to you. That we would be looking to you day in and day out for what you have to tell us next, Lord. That when you speak, we will hear because we are listening and we trust that you can speak to our hearts. We pray, Lord, as we go from this place that we would follow you forever and ever. But if there's someone in this room tonight who is not yet a Christian, you've not yet given your life to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity. The Bible says that we are sinners. We deserve to die for our sin, but Jesus died in our place. He rose again on the third day. Is there anyone who wants to believe that for the first time? If that's you, raise your hand so I can acknowledge you and pray with you. And maybe you don't want to raise your hands. Maybe you're scared. Maybe you're watching online and you're raising your hands and I can't see you. Pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve you. I deserve to go to hell for the things that I've thought about you, the things I've said about you, the things that I've done. But because you love me, Jesus, you died for me. You took my place on that cross. And since you died for me, I want to live for you. Lord, I want to let go of all of my old life. I don't want to hold on to it anymore. Please, Jesus, take it away from me. Let me be your child. And you be my God. I know you rose on the third day, Jesus. I know you love me. And I know you, I know you have chosen me. I give my life to you now. Pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen.